The election is done and dusted. But regardless of who won, there was consensus from the major parties that more has to be done at Williamtown on the mid-north coast of New South Wales, where fishers, farmers and local residents are living under a polluted cloud of uncertainty. Their health, livelihoods and homes are at risk from possible cancer-causing chemicals used to fight fires at the Williamtown Royal Australian Air Force Base. Sean Murphy has this report on the impacts of a contamination nightmare which may be replicated around Australia in the coming years. John Hewitt has been fishing the Hunter River for 50 years and his son John for more than 20. Today their mesh net is set for Mulloway, but the most productive part of the river system is now polluted with toxic chemicals and off limits. Fullerton Cove is the nursery for the Hunter's lucrative school prawn industry and an abundance of other species that feed off them. But this year, the Hewitts and another 15 fishers licensed to catch prawns sat idle during the six month season. We're in Fullerton Cove. How important has Fullerton Cove been to fishing in the Hunter? Oh, I'd say 80% of my living comes out of that. It's so a lot. And besides prawning, what else do you get here? Crab, my crab, my mash, do a lot. Eel, but you're not allowed to do nothing no more. Buggered us. And so, do you think you'll ever get back onto Fullerton Co? No. No, uh, we've come to the conclusion that Fullerton Co is shut for ever. The only way they'll reopen it if they stop the source of the leak, and the source of the leak's already out and about, so it's going to take a lot of years to clear the rest of the contamination. So, once the contamination's there, it's shut. The source of the contamination is the Royal Australian Air Force Base at Williamtown, just a few kilometres from Fullerton Cove. It's home to Australia's Hornet fighter jets, and dangerous chemicals listed as probable causes of cancer have been leaking from the base for years. Like airports, refineries and other facilities around Australia, firefighters at the base have been practising with foam retardants needed to control high temperature fires. Since 2003, Defence has known the foam contained potentially cancer-causing chemicals, perfluorooctane sulfonate and perfluorooctanoic acid, commonly known as PFOS and PFOA, and that they may have been contaminating neighbouring properties. So these are synthetic chemicals that are used in a whole range of industrial, commercial and in the past even in residential products uh, like Scotch Guards and Teflons, although they've since been phased out. The New South Wales Environmental Protection Authority has known about the pollution since 2011, but it was only made public in September last year. But it wasn't until August of last year that we saw some real pathways for human health exposure because we were seeing elevated levels in fish and we were seeing elevated levels in groundwater. And it was that trigger of exposure for, for people in the area that caused us to go out to the community and warn them about the risks. The chemicals have flowed through shallow drains like this one to Fullerton Cove and also Tilligary Creek upstream from Port Stephens. The EPA's Hunter Region Manager Adam Gilligan says his department's testing is only a backup because it has no jurisdiction over defence. We don't really have power to require things of them as we might with a private company. Generally speaking, when we're dealing with a, a, a private company, we've got very clear powers of entry and powers to require action to occur. Now, that isn't the case with a federal agency being, being managed by a state one. So it's been a different process for us. Uh, but And look, it took a little while to establish a good working relationship with Defence and, and some ground rules for that relationship. But we're now in, in, in quite a productive dialogue with Defence about the testing that's occurring, the assessment that needs to occur on those results and the way forward to dealing with this issue in the local community. It's not just commercial fishers affected by the contamination. 
there are more than 400 residents and farmers whose health, livelihoods and futures are now at risk. Come on, come on, come on! Len O'Connell's 90 hectare farm has been in his wife's family since 1895, but its future is now uncertain. He's reduced his herd of mostly Angus cattle to just over 50 cows and heifers and is worried about how safe they are. There has been some talk about you know, doing blood tests and taking meat samples and, uh, and that, but nobody seems too interested in it. I don't think they really want to know. Len O'Connell's farm is prone to flooding and one of the drains out of RAAF Williamtown flows through his property. It's just a sheet of water. It's, it's, it's waist deep. The water can hang around for months on end, up to you know, five months. Sometimes we've been flooded six times in a year. We've had our soil tested, but we haven't got our soil tests back. But the way the flooding is and the contaminated water that floods us, there's no hope. The soil's got to be contaminated. Our water's contaminated in a number of our bores. Um, one bore is not even suitable for, uh, to, to water cattle. He's now having to water his cattle from the home boar and is deeply worried about the human health implications for his family. He can't understand why the government is not funding community blood testing. It's frightening, you know, like the, the stories you hear, we don't know whether they're true, like the rumours that are going around that this contamination, it can cause, uh, you know, like problems with your lower organs, your liver, your kidneys, bowels, bladder, all that sort of thing. And um, we, we've asked the health department at these um, meetings that they hold and they can't tell us anything. The Marshall family live in what residents now call the red zone. And since the contamination was made public last year, they've been on bottled water supplied by Defence. Morning coffee, even cleaning their teeth, is a constant reminder of the threat to their health. But even with the recommended precautions, Nick and Mel Marshall still fear for their children. They've got nothing to lose. They'll, they'll just turn around in five years' time when it turns out this stuff's really bad and they'll say, uh, oh, well, we didn't know. And... It, is the uncertainty the hardest thing to deal with? Yeah, it's... You just... You don't know... I mean, we know now what our levels are on our property, but in five years' time, they could be a lot worse. We don't know and it's a matter of, you know, do you stay here and fight it and try and protect try and, manage and it. yeah, manage it and protect the property from it getting worse or do you just go, you know, it's not worth it. The vegetable patch is now a sand pit, the free range egg laying chickens are gone and soon they'll pull out all their fruit trees. Actually had great plans of planting more fruit trees through here and you know it's uh, obviously those are dashed now but it's uh, you can't grow anything that you can eat here now. Bye, Mum. The Marshalls say they feel betrayed by authorities who knew about the contamination long before they bought their one hectare block in October 2014. We put everything into this house. We put all our, like we've been here for 18 months, renovating the whole time. We've done so much work and we put all our money and time and blood, sweat and tears into it. But if this is going to make our kids sick, we'd well, walk away in a second. Defence is proud of its record in defending Australia. But residents and others affected by the contamination say the department has been too focused on defending itself. When the New South Wales Department of Premier and Cabinet organised a community reference group to inform and reassure those directly affected, Defence sent in its lawyers. Ian Lyle was the Department of Primary Industries representative on that committee. Of course, having lawyers lead the discussion um, was not the best thing for a community that was under stress, that had so many questions. And um, I think it was a different approach than we're used to seeing at a state level. At a state level, we're used to getting the agencies together and the, the experts together and, and moving forward very quickly. To be constrained by the liability issue, the compensation issue, the, um, the ownership of the issue, um, certainly slowed things down at the start. Look, it has been very poor. Defence has actually lost their social licence to carry on in this area. 
Now, I'd like to clarify that it's not people that are working on base. We know that they're not to blame. It is generally the defence bureaucrats that are sitting in Canberra that have handled this appallingly. Rihanna Gorfine lives in the so-called red zone with her partner and three children. She jointly heads a residence action group which has engaged a law firm to mount a class action against defence. At the moment we have no economic stability, even outside the red zone. People can't sell their houses. Um, they've lost buyers because finance has fallen through. Um, people are concerned about the contamination. Um, and at the end of the day, perception is reality. And you need to remember too that we as a community found out on the 4th of September 2015 Defence had let Hunter Water, Port Stephens Council and New South Wales EPA know two and a half years prior to that that the chemicals were found off base. And we know that they were testing years before that. So there's going to be a lot that does come out and um, that they haven't disposed of the chemical correctly um, and they haven't put the community first. It's not just residents in the investigation zone joining the class action. Fred Haskins grows Korean and Chinese daikon just outside the zone. He says there are too many unanswered questions. The questions we have is, is this contamination going to continue to come across? Uh, we all know this is on the Tomago sand beds. The water from here is probably the same as the waters up, up there. You know, there's been no answers uh, from either the you know, defence, EPA, state farming organisations or, or DPI, we, yeah, we, we're at a loss. The owner of this property and myself invested close to $200,000 in getting this up and going. Do we continue to invest or do we walk away? You know, that, that's it. We, and I suppose they don't know either, but the thing is, you know, we're between a brick and a hard wall. You know, we've put a lot of work in. Um, do we continue and, and go down the creek six, six months later or 12 months later or five years later? We don't know. Hello, how are you? Last month, Defence held a media conference at Williamtown to update the public on its environmental investigation. Television cameras were banned. Good morning, yes, Sean Murphy from Landline. May I? Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. So I'm, so I'm just checking, when we're not allowed to bring our camera in. That's right. So it's no visual, it's audio and still imagery only. And, and why no television cameras? Defence Media Ops have made that decision. I can't respond to that. That's their decision. OK. The chief of Williamtown Base later said there was no security reason for the camera ban. Defence Media declined our request for an interview. At the media conference, Air Vice Marshal Greg Evans said exhaustive testing of surface and groundwater in the investigation zone was 90% clear of the chemicals and three trials would soon begin on measures to clean up the contamination. The nation's top health experts, he said, would deliver their findings on the human health implications later this month. We are measuring it as rapidly as we can. We've got absolutely the best consultants on this. We've got the best labs doing the analysis. We will release all of the results in a report that will be useful to the EPA, to New South Wales Health, to residents and to us, and then we will take measures government directs to deal with it. Air Vice Marshal Evans said the lack of any Australian standard for human exposure to PSOA and PFOA had hampered the response so far, and there were likely to be many more cases of contamination around Australia. Firefighters at civil airports, oil refineries and even some bus depots used the firefighting foam and Defence says there are 18 air military sites where the foam was routinely used for 50 years. I think the country is going to have to deal with this um, across a very wide spread of areas. Um, uh, and I think we're going to have to probably have a national monitoring program to work out what situation we're all in. Environmental health experts from around Australia are now working on a national standard for safe exposure to the chemicals and they'll take into account new advice from the United States Environmental Protection Agency which has dramatically reduced the recommended safe levels in drinking water.
they've been relying on the same studies that have been undertaken in the past, particularly around rats and monkeys, but they've gone back and recalculated uh, their assessment of the concern posed by the chemicals. And that's seen them reduce the drinking water guide from, from 0.2 micrograms per litre down to 0.07. So it's about two thirds lower than it was previously. Health experts are also considering the tougher US standards. And there are fears the human health report this month could force the Hewitts and up to 30 fishers off the Hunter River altogether. Already, the younger John Hewitt has been travelling to unfamiliar estuaries to support his young family. But he says this is causing conflict with established fishers. There's a lot of fishermen that have to end up going to other estuaries and there's going to be uh, a lot of conflict happening. Yeah. I mean, you've fished here your whole adult life. I mean, you really get to know the water here. Can you transfer that knowledge to other uh, waterways? Every, every estuary is different in... Um, current, the way you work, the way you set your nets, everything's different and it's a big learning curve. you just got to um, put your head down and try hard as you can. Hunter River fishers now also face the added stress of being unable to invest in their businesses as part of a statewide reform of the New South Wales fishing industry. There's investment decisions going back and forth, there's a lot of shares being traded back and forth, a lot of promises being made and yet these guys cannot even go to the local bank and start working out what their business plans are because they don't have any certainty about their future. These fishermen have been feeding their families from the local area, have been giving them seafood from the local area, their families drink the local water, so they've got health concerns, they've got an industry that's been closed down, plus the major uncertainty, and now Department of Fence has come along and said, you have to go along and prove your financial loss. It's not right. Although only Fullerton Cove has been shut down, any fish caught in the Hunter River are no longer being sold for a premium at the Newcastle Fishermen's Cooperative. They're now sent to Sydney. That's been one of our toughest calls. Our customers come to our shop and ask us valid questions and, and we don't want to have to sit there and, argue and convince them that this is con or isn't contaminated. We're not scientists, you know, we, and they haven't been tested, a lot of them, so we, we're unsure. We have to put product in that window that the customer can be 100% certain that it's safe to eat. And although we, we believe that fish out of the river are, we can't convince them of that. We haven't got anything from Health, from EPA or from DPI to tell us or our customers that that product is safe to eat. So we've, we've had to take that measure. Newcastle's ocean-going prawn fleet could also face future restrictions on Hunter River school prawns caught at sea. The co-op is worried that the Human Health Report could impact fishers catching school prawns. Well, that's, that's our immediate concern. And, uh, so you've got now dozens of boats here that, that catch those school prawns on a yearly basis and every season around January to February and March. That would be significant loss to, to all co-op and fishers. Fishers such as Michael Coulter say it would be difficult to know where the school prawns came from. They're not always Hunter River prawns that are on this beach. They travel from down the coast as well. So any time that you go there and catch school prawns, you can't guarantee that they'll come out of the Hunter River. They couldn't come out of Tuckra Lakes or the Hawkesbury River. Um, they all come out and travel. So. Um, no guarantee of that, and, and, and how much do they flush themselves once they hit the ocean too. Since the day the contamination was made public last year, researchers from the Department of Primary Industries Port Stephens Fisheries Institute have been conducting exhaustive testing of up to 10 species commonly found at Fullerton Cove and in the upper Tillagheri Creek. First of all, we, we didn't see much of the PFOA contaminant. 
in these animals, but uh, the PFOS was definitely there. It, the levels tended to be higher in things like prawns and crabs and flatheads, so things that, that are most associated with the sediments. We're targeting 10 species, uh, school prawn, king prawn, mud crab, blue summer crab, yellowfin brim, luderick, silver biddy, flathead and sand whiting. Dr Matt Taylor is also investigating depuration rates in some species to see if they can purge or eliminate the dangerous chemicals and how long this takes. So there's some studies out of the, uh, the United States which show that rainbow trout actually have the ability to depurate the contaminant from their, uh, from their system. What they found is that uh, they isolated the animals from the contaminant, kept them in clean water within about 15 days they had uh, cleared about 50% of the contaminant from their system. And what have you found so far with the school prawns? Well, we haven't got any results back as, as yet, but what we're hoping to see is, is a similar thing happen in the school prawns. And, um, and, and as well as that, uh, we're going to be looking at a number of other species, including mud crab, uh, flathead, sand whiting, uh, mullet. Um, it's to kind of determine which species are able to purge a chemical, how quickly it happens, and um, as well as that, uh, develop some data to better manage the, uh, the, the contamination into the future. The DPI's research has already given oyster growers the all clear. Don Burgoyne's family has been growing oysters in the upper Tilligary Creek for 50 years. And while his business was affected when the contamination became public, the DPI's tests soon showed that oysters were hardly affected at all and were able to safely purge any contamination as soon as they were moved to other areas. Do you feel as though you've dodged a bullet? Yeah, I'd have to say that we, we do feel that it's... Uh... Oysters have just missed it. Uh, we, we don't have to worry, particularly. Uh, yeah, feel sorry for those who have been caught up in it more, but uh, for us, it's uh, full steam ahead. Hi there, I'm Don Burgoyne, and I've been growing oysters in beautiful Port Stephens now for 34 years. Don Burgoyne has been part of an advertising campaign to reassure the public about the safety of seafood from Port Stephens. He admits there has been some brand damage. When there's no problem, that's where we have to work to try make sure people are certain that the product's safe, and it is. We have very strict food safety management plans for harvesting, and this just fits in really well with all of that. And it's not just oyster farmers talking up the area's primary production future. At Maria's farm, right in the heart of the investigation zone, Cor Dezalcoen and his son Stefan are investing $75 million in a state-of-the-art greenhouse operation. The Dutch investors say they won't be affected by the contamination because they'll only be using rainwater captured from their two hectares of greenhouses or scheme water. Their produce will be grown on raised beds with no risk of ever touching any contaminated soil. We intend to start uh, with our cucumber production in November uh, this year and with the tomato, trust tomato uh, production in February next year. We are the only green dot in a very red area. Yeah, that's how you can see it. If only it was optimism flowing in the drains and not toxic chemicals. There are a lot of people that don't want to be in the area anymore. People that have contamination on their properties that don't want to live there, that have seen health effects within their family um, and they're concerned now. I mean, the, the, the mental health of the community is on a downward spiral. Um, you know, the, the what if, what is going to happen, the level of anxiety, um, I just want to get out of here, I want my family to be safe, um, what's the point? And the levels of trust within defence and the agencies is just is not there um, because the community doesn't feel that we've been put first um, and the community's concerns have been um, really taken on board. Mm -hmm.